All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started with our next presentation. Thank you for coming to the 2021 Iowa City Book Festival. My name is John Kenyon. I'm the executive director of the Iowa City UNESCO City uh, UNESCO City of Literature Organization. That's a mouthful. Uh, we are the presenting organization for the book festival. I would like to uh, start by thanking our sponsors for this year's festival. We have uh, support from the City of Iowa City, from the University of Iowa, and from Iowa Public Radio. I would also like to thank our partners with the Iowa City Public Library, where our event is originating from and where those of you who could join us in person are today. Uh, they've been wonderful hosts for us all week, as well as for uh, all of the years that the festival has been going on. And I also wanted to thank Prairie Lights, uh, our friends from our local independent bookstore, who uh, have been selling books for our festival authors, and they have a Christie's book uh, for sale out in the hallway for those of you who are here. For those of you watching on Zoom, uh, I know they would appreciate it if you visited prairielights.com. So uh, you can definitely get her book and books from all of our festival authors that way. So our presenter for this session is Christy Mabin Warren, who is the VO and Elizabeth Call Figgy Chair of Catholic Studies and a professor in the Departments of Religious Studies and Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies at the University of Iowa. I think your business card might be bigger than mine, actually. So <laughs> Dr. Mabin Warren is the author of The Priscilla Movement in America, Catholics, Protestants, and Fourth Day Spirituality, and of the new book, Meatpacking America, How Migration, Work, and Faith Unite and Divide the Heartland. So please help me welcome Christy Nabin Warren. Okay, I'm going to take this off so that I can breathe. So thank you, John, for introducing me. I have a few, some props for today. It's a little show and tell. Um, it's really good to be here in Iowa City. Um, I've been here for nine years, and I've grown to really love this city. Um, I'm a native Midwesterner. I'm a Hoosier. I'm from Northwest Indiana, from Steel town of Gary, Indiana. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about this, what led me to writing this book. So, and then I'll read some parts from the book. So I thought I would talk for about 20 minutes and then open up for questions. So um, I grew up in a working class home. Most members of my family either worked for the steel mills or they were teachers. It, it was fairly gendered, but there were male teachers, but most men in my family worked in the steel mill. So I've always been interested in the interplay of work, religion, and migration because um, I, I'm a, a, a grandchild of migrants from the Dachau Valley in Lebanon and Poland. And so I've always been interested and fascinated with those dynamics since I was a kid. So I'm trained as an ethnographer of religion, as an anthropologist of religion, and I've always tried to basically find the story no matter where I've lived, whether that's been in South Phoenix, Arizona, looking at a Latino community and their devotion to La Virgen de Guadalupe, or the Corsillo movement, um, which is a vibrant religious movement um, rooted in Mallorca, Spain, that traversed through the United States. And this newest book, Meatpacking America, once I moved here, came here in the fall of 2012, I started to look for a story. Um, what's going on here in Iowa? What's interesting? I've always liked to read uh, really good journal, um, journalistic pieces. In fact, I assign books and articles by journalists in my classes because they tend to write very clearly and very compellingly and they tend to not use a lot of jargon. And it was really important to me, uh, again, coming from my working class family and coming from a family where a lot of folks didn't graduate from high school, you know, I, I wanted to write, I want to write for my interlocutors. So the folks that I'm working with, I want them to be able to understand what I'm writing and I want them to see themselves in the writing and I want to always foreground their stories and not theory. So if you know me and you know my, my training, you know that the theory is embedded and that it's mostly in the end notes, but mostly it's my interlocutor stories. And so that's a little bit about myself. And so as I was driving around and meeting folks like Chaka Church, who was tell, who were telling me all these great things about Iowa, I spent the first year here really driving around the state and trying to sniff out a story. And as someone who's trained in Catholic studies like myself, a non-Catholic who's trained in Catholic studies, I've always been an outsider, what I, I would call an intimate outsider to the worlds that I study. Um, the story of rural Catholic parishes and rural religion and all the migration that was going on in these places, the dynamic, these dynamic spaces of Latinos and Africans and Burmese and Vietnamese and white ethnics, I'm like, oh my gosh, nobody's really writing about this. So this book started out being called Corn Belt Catholicism because it originally originated 
uh, I wanted it to be a comparative study of three rural Catholic parishes. And my original research question was, um, what's going on in these rural parishes? How are rural Catholic priests dealing with quickly changing dynamics? And how are the once majority white ethnic Catholics, primarily Czech and German and Polish Catholics, how are they dealing with uh, this, this radically changing space? And so I started to conduct interviews um, probably in the spring 2013. And by the time I found my way to the meatpacking plants, which I never plan on doing, I probably talked to about 100 people, all told about 140 by the time I finished the research. Um, and the thing that I love about doing ethnography is it, it, we call it the snowball method. So you start talking with a few people, they say, hey, go talk to these people. And then it literally snowballs from there. Well, my space of doing research started out in the Catholic parishes, and then it moved to diners and cafes and the homes of my interlocutors, and then um, to parks, public parks. I spent a lot of time in parks watching parishioners' kids run around and sort of helping the babysit while we were talking. You know, ethnography is a very dynamic method, and I love it because I can't sit still, and like you can see, I'm moving now. Uh, and so it, it's, a, it's a method that really fits my personality. I like to move around a lot. I'm a fairly dynamic person. And so um, I realized as I was coding the interviews that almost every single one of my interlocutors, my interviewees worked at a meatpacking plant, whether it was Tyson, Hogs, Fresh Meats, as it's called, in Columbus Junction, Iowa, which was a primary research site, or Marshalltown, or Ottumwa, or Tama, Iowa, Iowa Premium Beef. And I thought, oh my God, I need to go to a meatpacking plant. Full disclosure, I've been a vegetarian for over 30 years, so I'm like, okay, this is going to be a hard <laughs> ethnographic journey here. But I really felt called. I really felt like I had to do this. And it was a, a, a priest friend of mine, Father Joseph Sia, formerly of St. Joseph, a Catholic worker in um, Columbus Junction, who said, yeah, you need to go to the meatpacking plant. I said, okay. So he had, he had a friend at Columbus Junction, uh, Joe Blay, who's the chaplain there. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the broadband chaplaincy program at these plants, which is fascinating, troubling at the same time. I unpack it in the book. And um, he also knew the human resources manager at Tyson. So he got me access to Tyson. And from there, I spent a lot of time at Tyson. I had multiple visits. I was able to see the intake barn with the hogs, the whole process. And I wanted to have another research site. Um, so that became Iowa Premium Beef. And I don't have a lot of slides, but I wanted to show you a couple. So, so this is Columbus Junction, Iowa. So those of you who have been there, uh, it's, it's a town, that very much the lifeblood of the town uh, is very dependent on the Tyson plant. The majority of folks in the town work for some facet of the plant, whether it's tending to cows, whether it's uh, growing seeds for the corn and harvesting the corn for the hogs. So that's all interconnected, right? And the vast majority of uh, town folks work at the plant. And so I had been going to uh, the Doce de Diciembre, the Virgen de Guadalupe celebration for many years in various parishes as a, as a scholar. And here's one from Columbus Junction, Iowa. One of the things that I wanted to do in this book was most scholars study religion in particular places. Okay, in what, if it's a parish, a temple, um, a synagogue, and I wanted to show how religion is dynamic, how everyday working people literally wear religion on them in the form of tattoos and scapulars and rosaries, saying prayers while they're working the line at the plant. So I wanted to, I wanted to produce a study that studied religion in all its dynamic forms, what scholars call lived religion. And so I did a lot of field work in the parishes, but I also went to the packing plants as well. And this is just a little snapshot from the annual celebration. If you've, if you've never been, it's beautiful. Uh, there's always a great meal afterward. Uh, and West Liberty also has a wonderful uh, Dia de Guadalupe celebration. So this is one of my two main field sites, the meatpacking plants, Tyson Pork Processing Facility. And I'm going to read you a little bit um, uh, uh, what it was like in the plant. And so what I tried to do in this book was to really push back on the tropes of the Midwest. I try to do a lot of things, but um, as a lifelong Midwesterner, it's always bothered me that the Midwest is, you know, called flyover. And it's this really simplistic, tropey place. You're either a white Trumpy, reactionary, angry, white, racist person, or, you know, you're this or that. And I really wanted to provide a very nuanced argument based on a deep dive of seven years worth of ethnography that would really push back um, against these tropes. So it's very much a but and story. 
So I'm gonna to read to you a little bit um, from the preface. The place where I live and work and where thousands of refugees have journeyed to since the early 1970s is the Corn Belt state of Iowa. Word is spread among women and men fleeing violence and instability in their home countries that this Midwestern state is a beautiful, safe, and affordable place to live and where jobs in meatpacking and agriculture are plentiful. As a person born and raised in the Midwest whose livelihood is based on studying and teaching about American religion and culture, I've had the privilege and pleasure of diving into the realities of the newest waves of migration in this part of the country. I've conducted research in my backyard, so to speak, and have spent a lot of time talking with refugees and white Iowans alike in order to see what we can learn about America and its place in the world by centering the nation's corn belt. The result of this research is this book, Meatpacking America, which aims to tell a complicated and dynamic story of native-born Iowans and more recent arrivals to Iowa and the larger Corn Belt. The elements that drive the story of disparate native-born Iowans and newer arrivals, I argue, are the conjoined passions of religious faith and desire to work hard for one's children and grandchildren in order to achieve a slice of heaven on earth. What I've discovered complicates many of the stories we tell each other and that the news typically reports. So I wanted to do what I would call a cold take rather than a hot take. Um, certainly the United States, like many nations today, is deeply divided in regard to how migrants, asylum seekers, asylees, refugees, and economic migrants alike are viewed and treated. U.S. immigration law is complicated and confusing and it confers a certain legal status and privileges to refugees not given to asylum seekers and economic migrants. I put these all in quotes, <laughs> air quotes. Yet the reality is that there's a lot of overlap in the experiences of women and men who are fleeing their home countries. Legally designated refugees receive preferred treatment and in accordance with US immigration law, they're granted a special immigration status as a group. Refugees must apply for a lawful permanent resident status or their green card one year after being admitted to the U.S. and are eligible for U.S. citizenship within five years. Asylum seekers, asylees, people who do not technically fit the U.S. Def definition of refugee status, but who are fleeing violence and instability of their home countries, become eligible to adjust to permanent resident status after one year of residence. And so what I want to do in this book is I refer to all of the brown and black women and men who come to this America for a better life as refugees, whether or not they've been officially granted the de jure status, um, the de facto status then of refugee by the U.S. government. I make the argument, I say I wanted to, to make it crystal clear for the reader, for the audience today, um, that the women, men, and children I've spent a lot of time with over the past several years for the writing and research of this book did not simply want to leave their home countries. They had to, or they would die. And they really want to get that across. One of the things I really do too in the early part of the book is I trace the history of Iowa and other states, but mostly Iowa and how it's historically responded to refugees. And it might come as a surprise, but our state actually was very progressive in the 70s and 80s. When we look at um, the late Republican governor, Robert Ray, I see you know, there were a lot of moderate Republicans, more like Bob Dole kind of Republicans, who you know, welcomed the Vietnamese tie down boat people and were very progressive and welcoming and developed Iowa Shares program, which is some of you I'm sure know, because you're involved with that, you know, some of you in the room, saying for Iowa sends help to aid refugees and then starvation. And so there was a lot of interfaith ecumenical, there was, there was a lot of activity going on in the 70s and 80s that I think we're seeing a return to today, but those kinds of interfaith ecumenical lefty religious movements, those don't get a lot of airtime. And so I want to give um, credence to those group in the, groups in the book too. This book tells a but and story referring to what I said earlier. That is ethnocentrism and anti-immigrant sentiments are deeply ingrained in the warp and weft of life in America. Yet how people act and what they do belie the entanglements of racism and its twin ethnocentrism. What I saw in my seven years worth of field work in rural Iowa and small towns and hamlets is that people are complicated and can act in contradictory ways. So this book, um, in some ways comes at an unpopular time when nuanced arguments aren't always very popular. We're told that we have to choose sides and there's one right way and one wrong way. And I try to say that it's a lot messier, a lot more complicated than that. So it's not really a, 
a popular stance to take these days. So I have to say I was really nervous when the book came out. It's gotten good reviews so far, but I was very nervous. When, and not so much that I might be sued by the meatpacking plants, which I have been a little worried about, but they're okay with it so far, I think. <laughs> For native born and I had to assign disclosures and all kinds of things. And that's a story I could share later. For native born and recent arrivals to Iowa, their house, houses of worship are sanctuaries in a world that is unpredictable and hard. For native born white Iowans, Churches, and I talked to a lot of these folks, churches became sanctuaries during and after the farm crisis of the 80s. And for newer arrivals, it's so too, it's a safe harbor, a home where community and safety are possible. I'm going to get into a little bit of thick description, uh, what anthropologists would call, of the plants, but I want to read one more part that I think is really important for you to know um, that was the backdrop of how, how I entered into this um, project. I guess where I actually ended up coming to after I did the research, really. The specter in all of this is white racism, white's vexed understandings of white privilege and race in America. What I encountered in my ethnographic field work is what I call the sticky wicket of whiteness. The whites I interviewed struggled and, and struggled with their towns changed and changing demographics, places like Columbus Junction, Washington, West Liberty, Ottumwa, Marshalltown, Tama. They know intellectually and from experience that their towns were once crumbling and that they're now doing much better economically, thanks to refugee substantial economic contributions. They tolerate, even accept, the presence of refugees in their communities because after all, it's refugees labor that's kept them alive. And my friend and colleague, Art Cullen, as if you know his beautiful journalism, Pulitzer Prize winning journalism, he's written about this too in his work and in his own book, Storm Lake. Yet, they struggle with this major change and the browning of their towns and state. They miss their downtowns being all white. And it's discomforting for them to think about this. Many rural whites are sorting through their complex feelings about refugees. They experience the thriving downtowns and smell the delicious foods that weren't there before, like Burmese food, which is cooked in green tea leaves. It's amazing. If you haven't tried it, it's downtown. They pass by their Latino neighbors, carefully maintain yards, cars, and homes, and they see the lit velas, the candles at night, and they see La Virgen de Guadalupe in yards, and they're proud because they shared a Catholic heritage. But at the same time, many white, white rural Americans wish things could be what they imagine as, quote, the way they were before, white, nostalgic, and predictable. The complication of white rural America is a longing for whiteness, sameness, mixed with an appreciation of the increased diversity in their towns and the new friendships they've made. Yes, the problem of whiteness is racism, a belief that whiteness is superior. It's a racism that points to the cognitive dissonance most white Americans live with and within. Yet what I discovered in the course of my research is that many white rural Americans have varying degrees of awareness of the racism and complicity. So this book really tries to understand where these Americans are coming from to paint a more complete portrait of them. So I try to give even time to white ethnics who have their own struggles, as well as African, Asian, and Latinx refugees who are mostly coming from the Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Mexico. So I want to read you now, I'm trying to tie myself, I don't want to talk too much, um, but I want to give you, um, I want to give you a sense of one of my interlocutors, um, Maurice and his wife Benita, and then I want to read to you a little bit from the meatpacking plant, and then I want to open up for questions. Well, first, actually, no. First, I'm going to start with a little bit of the plant. I'm going to kind of bring you in. So just to trigger a uh, Trigger alert, it's going to be a little gross. So, <laughs> so this is uh, my tour uh, of Tyson, my first tour there. The smell, it hit me like a bludgeon when I opened the car door. A violent smell, warm, moist, and pungent. I'm going to have a bad word in here for children. My daughter in the room has heard it at home. The smell of shit and animal flesh. Sorry. Death. My bodily instinct was to retch. I bent downward and grabbed my knees. I told myself that I could not, absolutely could not faint or throw up on this tour of Tyson. I wore nondescript clothing, black pants, and a long sleeve blue cotton shirt from Walmart. My hair was pulled back snugly in a ponytail, old running shoes were on my feet. I wore what was recommended to wear for the day, comfortable, affordable, and practical clothing and shoes that were actually from Tyson's and that I still wear. They're caterpillar, steel toe caterpillar boots, which are great. They're awesome. I was ready for work. My legs trembled a bit as I walked with some fear and trepidation toward the check-in station, where I met my friend 
Father Joseph Sia of Columbus Junction, and the plant chaplain, Joe Blay. Yes, you heard that right, read that right, that's what I wrote, the plant chaplain. Tyson is a leader in a growing corporate movement to have men and women of God on the payrolls. The company is an important participant in the broader faith at work movement in the United States that can be traced back to the early 20th century. Tyson promotes faith in the workplace and in a sense, packages and promotes a new brand of faith for its employees who in turn draw on this workplace faith to get them through their shift a faith in hard work, grit, and determination that relies on a Protestant work ethic pervades the co contemporary Tyson meatpacking plant and corporate culture. In rural meatpacking plants, animals are raised, killed, and sold in a pattern, maybe you've heard this term before, vertical integration. It's all in a very tight, closed loop where everything happens. Much as religion, specifically evangelical Protestant Christianity, pervades the vertical integration process of animals from birth to slaughter. The previously independent facets of animals, humans, and religion are now in one sprawling, bloody place. The packing plants that contain animals, people, um, an evangelistic fervor is present in companies like Tyson, where food, faith, and the, and the workplace are vertically integrated to form the American dream of values laced lace success. Once we were inside Tyson's check-in building, we signed waiver forms and presented our driver's licenses. Then Father Joseph and I were given official visitor badges. I bought my, brought my visitor badge from Iowa Premium Beef. I couldn't find my Tyson one, and I was given a plush pig. Squeezy, my dog, my dog ruined the other one. It's all torn up. And here's the one from Iowa Premium. She tore off its ear. Um, I wanted to show you that. So as we were walking back towards the main plant, uh, we passed large signs of welcome in English, Spanish, French, Hakka Chin, a Burmese language, and Vietnamese. The smells I experienced in the parking lot enveloped us on a concentrated level as we entered the main plant. Here it was even more palpable, concentrated, trapped, and stuffy air. And this is all pre-COVID, by the way. All the research was done pre-COVID. A combination of flesh, hair, and excrement. It was as the American realist muckraker Upton Sinclair wrote of the smell at the Chicago stockyards, quote, it was an elemental odor, raw and crude. It was rich, almost rancid, sensual, and strong. The smells bonded with our bodies and we carried them with us throughout the day. The recently renovated administrative wing was a brief respite from the smell. After we passed through these doors, we were greeted by Dave Duncan, the cheery, ever ever friendly human relations manager of the plant who was to be our tour guide that afternoon waves of febreze tropical scent wafted over us thanks to enterprising secretaries hard at work combating the porcine stench poor things they just they they really tried hard but it wasn't working <laughs> it's almost like you know when your teenage sons try to spray axe after they haven't showered in four days kind of like that you know dave warmly shook our hands as we entered his office he gestured toward the white lab coats hard hats hair nets and gloves that were neatly laid out and ready for us we even had special orange plugs squishy ones as the floor of the plank gets very loud Safety first, it's Tyson's mantra. We dressed according to Dave's instructions, covering or netting all hair on our heads. Men with beards and mustaches must cover those as well. Buttoning the coats all the way up to our necks and inserting our earplugs in the way that we're shown. Dave prepped us with the information, letting us know we'd be walking through the cold rooms first before entering the warm ones. He told us there would be blood, body parts, and the occasional eyeball and kidney that had been popped. When Dave turned to me and asked me point blank if I was squeamish around this kind of stuff, without hesitation, I said, no, I'm okay with it. I nodded, <laughs> dug my bit nails into my palms. My children know I'm a lifelong nail biter, not much there, but I was digging them in. And I said, no, I learned to breathe through my mouth. And we did wear a face, actually masked, much like we're wearing today. Dave knew that Father Joseph could handle it because he'd been there several times. And I was determined to handle it too. Walking out on the meatpacking floor for the first time is like stepping into an alternative reality, but this was real, bloody real. It was loud, cold, and crimson red. There was a lot going on, and it was really loud despite the fact that we were wearing earplugs. There's an intense order to the plant, and each worker has a repetitive yet also highly skilled task. We walked by women and men with various knives and blades cutting through the now chilled pork meat, so it had been chilling for 48 hours in the blast chiller slicing and cutting parts that would be sold at wholesale and retail markets in places like Fairway, Bacon. The white coats were splattered with blood and fat and awful. The plant was cold and constantly surveilled by USDA inspectors. Fat, meat droppings, and the occasional eyeball again washed down the drains next to our feet. 
we walked and stood amidst thousands of pounds of cold flesh. As I raised my eyes to look above me, a light spray of water mixed with hog waste managed to enter my mouth. I knew I should not spit it out, so I swallowed it. I can still taste, smell, and see the meat as I write this. At this particular pork processing plant, 10,000 hogs at 200 pounds apiece are killed, or as the company prefers to say and use the euphemism, harvested and processed each day. Rows upon rows of cows with raised teats on their underbellies, they recently nursed and unbeknownst to them, wean their piglets moved past us, slow enough so that we would take in the girth and their lifeless bodies. As we followed Dave's path through the cold cutting floor, the hog's feet and hooves grazed my arms and shoulders and bumped gently into my white coated side. They were heavy, rubbery, and so heavy that I stumbled a bit at first at the first body brushing against me. Turning from the hogs on our right, I learned that the prime meat rib that we see in the stores is cut by a highly trained worker whose primary job is to slice blades in a very precise way. So we hear a lot about this being unskilled work. I'm also pushing back against this. This is highly skilled trained work. The CME's employee cutting the prime ribs use graceful and precise movements, slicing through huge slabs of meat that move by him on a conveyor line. According to Dave, this is one of the hardest jobs on the line, one that required exact timing, a degree of swiftness, and graceful bodily movements. He also told us that African and Latino workers are the best because they have the best work ethic. We can unpack this later if you want. The worker we witnessed in action was like a dancer, but one who dodges blades and knives with precision and elegance. I know I'm reading a lot. Um, there's so much I get so hard, you know, to pick parts, but... Um, I, um, let me show you a couple slides and then maybe we can open it up and I can always do more reading if you wanted. So here's Iowa Premium Beef. I spent um, an entire work week there. So I stayed at a little motel up the street and I would show up at 5 a.m. every day and I would work until like 8 p.m. And uh, so I was able to get to know every facet of the plant. And so I was in the intake barn where the cattle go and I was able to see the slaughter and I write about this. Um, so I, I take the reader through every single part of the plant, and um, I get to the tour of the plants after I've shared a lot of stories from the refugees who've shared with me how difficult this work is um, and how their faith for them gets them through this horrible job. Um, I, um, yeah, and let's see, one more slide, I think. Here's Father Joseph. I talked about him a little bit. He does a lot of social justice advocacy work. I would say what he does is liberation theology, pre uh, preferential option for the poor. Um, every year he gives um, a, 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 a homily, a mass for farm workers in Conesville, Iowa, who harvest melons. I write a little bit about Conesville and Bell's Melons and problematize Bell's Melons a little bit in the book. Um, I write a bit about CAFOs, um, confined animal feeding operations. And again, you know, when we trace the movement of urban meatpacking from cities like Cincinnati and Chicago, where they were unionized, to right to work red states, so there's all, this is all in the book, like Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, I mean, this move was, in, was intentional, and unions were gutted, and, you know, CAFOs and meatpacking plants alike are actually really hard to find, and they're hidden. I know I was driving around with my now 15-year-old son. We were, we were on our CAFO hunting tour. We were trying to take pictures of, of CAFOs for the book, and they're really hard to find, and, that, and that's on purpose. Um, I wanted to leave you with this slide. Uh, we are number one and number two, our state. There are, there's more <clears throat> pig shit in the state than any other state in the country. Um, the environmental impact of, of these meatpacking plants um, is really devastating, and you know the wastewater goes into the waters. If any of you have ever kayaked, please don't uh, in this area because it's. I mean, we have, and it's, it's really bad for your skin. There's a lot of fertilizer runoff. There's a lot of um, fecal matter and a lot of water around here. So um, I'm critical of the meatpacking industries and the devastation uh, that they're doing to the air and the soil and the water. Um, Dr. Heiser knows this well in his own work. Um, and I also make a big argument that 
the workers themselves, mostly African, Latino, and poor whites, are considered to be fungible commodity, commodities, just like the animals, right? And so I show that link, and the land is really uh, considered to be a fungible commodity. Um, I want to end on a hopeful note before we open it up, though. Despite the horror of this industry, um, every single person I interviewed for this book um, emphasized that they, they are proud of what they do. None of them want their own children to do this work, but they're really proud. They don't want anyone to feel sorry for them. And uh, I, have, I have to say, after the tours I had in the time I spent me packing mods, there's no way I could do this, this kind of work. And there's very, very few working class whites on the line these days in sharp contrast, you know, to the 60s and 70s, even earlier um, when there was strong unionization. So these are vulnerable people living precarious existence, working in an industry where there's a really high turnover rate and where injury rate is very high. And so it's pretty dire. And so one of the hopes that I have with folks who read this book is that we really start to think maybe about our own meat consumption. I personally don't eat meat, but I'm complicit. I buy meat for my kids, they eat meat, I, I prepare it for them. It's not so much maybe that I'm trying to convince people to not eat meat, but thinking more mindfully of it and just thinking about the broad spectrum and really having a face, thinking about the people who um, produce and harvest, you know, and kill and, and package the animals and having a deeper respect um, and maybe getting involved in some social justice movements as a result. So I'll end here. There's so much more I can say, but I wanted to open up for questions. So thanks. And I know folks are on Zoom too, so. That's, I'll go back because that was a gross slide. We'll look at a better slide. I want you to look at the poop slide. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, okay, great. We've got some questions in the room. I will get around to everyone. I did want to let folks know on Zoom, we don't have any questions from Zoom yet. But we have plenty of folks watching. So if you would like to submit a question, please do so in the Q&A box and I will get uh, that weeded into, or weeded, threaded into our uh, questions here. So we had questions up front here. Maybe I'll just start here and I'll work my way around. Okay. Oh, thank you. This is great. I've, this has been, I know, a long time coming. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, what I didn't know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I didn't know, but what the thing that struck me the most was about the chaplain. Yes. That they employ uh, one chaplain, yes. maybe more than one chaplain, I don't know. Yes. Uh, and I just, there's a terrible irony in that in and of itself, but I think of the research was pre-COVID. We know a lot yes. happened during COVID. Right. But these plants basically tried to uh, ignore the circumstances that contributed to the spread of the disease right. and uh, with the complicity of the state, in this case of Iowa, the state Absolutely. government, uh, and both Columbus Junction uh, and Tamar were hit hard, yeah. as was Waterloo yeah. as well. How do you, yeah. how do you, is there, is, is this, the fact that they are concerned with the religious welfare of their workers and at the same time, they're not concerned with the lives of their workers. How do you, how do you respond to that yeah, contradiction? I, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Dr. Heiser, for your excellent question. Yes, Dr. Heiser has known about this project for a long time and has heard early iterations of it. So thanks for being here. And your own work really was very instrumental in my own work. I hope you know that. Yeah, and so I spent a lot of time with Joe Blay in here. And Joe's, Joe is uh, very critical of the industry. And... Um, went off record a few times. So some of the quotes here where there's nobody attributed. <laughs> so um, maybe I should this being recorded. But um, so um, yes, the research for this was done before COVID. Um, Joe was, has been and openly very critical of this. And what's been really wonderful, the outcome, what happened after COVID is that workers just stopped showing up. So it's precise. So here's where I have hope too, that perhaps we are going to see some unionization. I just talk, was talking with David, Good, David, our friend David the other day, Goodner with Catholic Worker. We presented in a class together uh, with Iowa CCI. Um, there's movements to unionize, and there's enough workers now from Tyson Columbus Junction who are showing up in Catholic parishes in West Liberty, St. Joseph, and there's a lot of St. Joseph's in the state. St. Joseph's in West Liberty and St. Joseph's, the worker in Columbus Junction, are starting to unionize. It's going to be a slow process because of the history of the state and because of the current administration, right, which is incredibly anti-union and the plants themselves, right? But the workers themselves are starting to organize. And churches are a space 
safe space for these organizing and it takes me back it takes us back to the 60s and 70s organizing in churches and so a good friend of mine Felipe Hinojosa has a really great book out now called Apostles of Change showing how Latino workers um, and worked with priests activist priests uh, and really drew on Catholic social justice and, and liberation theology you know back in the 60s and 70s and so I see this not coming to fruition yet, but I see movement. So I put out an op-ed last year that was kind of like, okay, this, okay, now everyone's writing about me packing plants. Let me give you a snapshot of what, what happens in these places and how hard these workers work and, and that they're incredibly vulnerable. So what happened at the Columbus Junction plant was the PPE and all of the safety protocols that they actually implemented that were code with OSHA happened only because two thirds of the workforce didn't show up. So it wasn't the paternalism or the evangelical fervor or the love of, of, of their family. So Tyson is very intentional in using what I call uh, a thinly veiled um, evangelical lexicon of faith, family, and stewardship, right? It's, it's um, you know, tied with the Protestant work ethic, right? And so guys like Joe, yeah, so every Tyson plant as chaplain. Most of these chaplains were actually military chaplains mm -hmm. who were, uh, were saw combat experience, right? Joe himself has had PTSD. Uh, he had been in Afghanistan. And he, he told me himself, he goes, yeah, it's intentional that most of us are we're our former um, military chaplains because we've actually been in battle. He said, this is like being in battle. This is bloody. This is violent. Most of the refugees, so think about it, right? Most of these refugees are already struggling with mental health issues. PTSD, and they're in a violent industry, right, of blood. It's, they're the highest paying jobs at the time, right? They're not unionized, but they're fairly high paying jobs for Iowa. If you compare, um, you know, uh, rates of like just starting out, it's pretty high. It's about $15, $16. Um, and if you've worked there a while, you get 401k, you get all these things, but they're not unionized. So I'm not, I'm not making a case for right to work states, but for a recently arrived refugee, and if you if you know multiple languages, you can get a job as a translator, like Maurice Batubenga in here, um, and a couple other of mine would become friends, and you make even more, you make like 20, 25 an hour. So yeah, I mean, the plants responded only because the workers, um, and I didn't look so much at Waterloo, things were even more egregious there. I mean, right, the managers were even betting on who was gonna like live and die. I mean, it was just horrific, right? Um, not, I don't want to let Columbus Junction off the hook saying they were like way better, you know, but, um, but, but it was mostly Burmese families and um, Mexicano families and a small number of Guatemalan families, um, Kanjabal speaking, who were like, hey, you know, a paycheck, it's not worth, um, a, a, getting a paycheck isn't worth risking, you know, my abuelita's health or my abuelo's health, you know, like, because these are mixed generational homes, right, with grandparents, sometimes great grandparents. Um, and so if you bring COVID home, you know, grandma and grandpa might die who are taking care of your children while you're at work. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I'm glad that the meatpacking plants now are in the spotlight, right, and are, are receiving a lot of um, attention. Uh, our state is much like North Carolina, though, right to work state. And Tyson, as you may know, was very much, um, what's, what's a, a non-political kinder term, I'll say cahoots. Well, I'll just say it, we're, we're very much in line with the, with the Trump presidency and um, got kickbacks, you know, for not doing certain things. So yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I try to be very critical of the industry here. I do actually, um, where I talk about public health is with tuberculosis. Actually, um, uh, one of our, our fellow churchgoers um, uh, tipped me off to Dr. Hornick in the hospital, who's a pulmonologist. So I interviewed Dr. Hornick about, um, he's an expert on TB and how easily it spreads. Tuberculosis is something that many refugees are carriers for and very susceptible to. And so TB, uh, um, tends to flourish in these meat packing plants. And so I have a little section on, you know, how TB um, has gotten out of control on some of these plants. Now we have COVID, right? So great. That's a long-winded question to your very succinct question. So <laughs> thanks. Go here and then I'll come over to you. Oh. Hi, Christy. Hi. Um, <laughs> I am just, I'm so curious about the chaplain program oh, too. Sure. Yeah. And is that is that common for people to center in on that as mm -hmm. as the kind of a kind of strange and weird yeah new 
yeah. new deal. Yeah. But so far, I've heard you talk mostly about Catholic um, clergy and yeah. Catholic yeah. lay people yeah. and believers. Yeah. You know, you talk about evangel evangelical uh, activity. And is there much Protestant um, uh, movement? And also, when you say Burmese, is that is that a Christian community as well? Or what about non-Christian um, uh, influence here? So, That's a great question. Tell your whole keeping me on task. These are great questions. Yeah. And I will say disclosure, because I have a Catholic Studies chair position, I, I really wanted to... I focus a lot on Catholics in my research, you know, but I also, um, so most of the time that I spent in Catholic spaces were spent in, in Catholic parishes, but I talked with a lot of Protestants, Jehovah's Witnesses, most um, Hakka speaking Chin Burmese in Columbus Junction go to a Methodist and a Baptist church or two churches they go to. There's like three families who go to St. Joseph the Worker. So um, yeah, I'm already thinking like if I were to do some anything over in this book, because at some point you just have to like cut off the research, you know, and that's always hard to know. I talk with my students about this. Hello. We talk about this. Like, how do you know when to like stop the research? You know, I think I, I would have liked to have spent some more time into some Protestant spaces, although I interview quite a few Protestants and most of the um, CEOs and CFOs of the plants are Protestant. Most of them are Methodist and Baptist. Um, it would have been nice to have gone into some of the spaces. But certainly, I would say that um, there's a lot on Catholicism in here, in part because um, there's so much Catholicism in these rural Iowa spaces. Um, and, and most Latinos in these rural communities, and all of my scholarship is focused very intentionally on Latinx, um, Christians have, are, the vast majority are Catholic. More and more are Pentecostal though, and I did interview quite a few African Pentecostals, primarily Congolese. Um, I did interview um, some Sudanese Muslim women who work at the Iowa Premium Beef, and I have a little bit about Islam in the workplace, and I can, I can tell you about that. But yeah, they're, they're, it's a fairly Catholic heavy book, but trying to attend to the fact that these meatpacking plants are places, they're very dynamic inter-religious places. And the other part of your question that's really great is, you know, most of the folks I talked to identified themselves as religious. So most of the interviews took place outside of the packing plant, but the interviews that I had inside the packing plants, uh, which were in locker rooms and in the lunch rooms and just like on the line, I was talking to folks, um, most of them self-identified as Christian. And so um, there were a few who identified as atheists but the, and agnostic, maybe four or five, but the vast majority identified as religious and talked about how they drew on their religion um, in an embodied sense. So like a lot of the Latino Catholics wore scapulars and rosaries and had tattoos um, and talked about that materiality and, and presence and how they brought it into the packing plants with them. Um, a lot of the men I talked with, um, African, Latino, Vietnamese um, were the majority of folks talked about how they would have prayer, like they would pray or as they were walking in, they would like communicate with God. So it was fascinating to me, like, you know, within religious studies, my primary field, you know, again, there's a growing uh, scholarship on religion at work, because, you know, most of us spend a lot of our time at work, right? Uh, and so I, I'm really interested in that broader um, uh, scholarship. And so it was so interesting to me that I saw so much religion and heard about how religion is used in very practical ways in these packing plants. So I'll give you the example of Iowa premium beef. So I was in the locker room um, and you know, these places, um, the poor janitors are trying to keep it clean. I mean, this poor woman, you know, had a, a scrubby, you know, she had her water and she was trying to clean the grease that's just everywhere. And uh, there was a big bucket of what's called quat. It's like a powdered soap. It kind of smells like Tide. And she was constantly throwing it on the floor in the locker room because it's really greasy and slippery. And so it's kind of hazardous. So she's throwing the soap down, the powdered soap. She's wiping it down. And that was when I was mostly observing, chatting with her a little bit. But all of a sudden, I, I saw a, group, a small group of Muslim women, Sudanese women, uh, performing ablutions in the sinks. 
imagine this like greasy, dirty locker room. Religi you know, in religious studies, uh, oftentimes there's this binary profane and sacred. So it's like a very profane place, but a very sacred thing is, is happening here. These, these women were performing ablutions. Um, they had a small little area cordoned off with like a shower curtain, like a, like a semicircle. And um, they had their prayer rugs rolled up and off the floor, which was greasy. And they unrolled their prayer rugs, closed the curtain and did a call to prayer. And um, I was talking with the human resources folks. They don't have um, a chaplaincy in Iowa Premium Bay. And it was funny. They're like, oh, yeah, you were at Tyson. Well, they, they tend to privilege Christianity. Where are we open to all faiths? So there's like this like little competition. Like, well, you know, we're, and I think she even used like interfaith. I was like, wow, that's really intentional, you know? And so, um, you know, because it, it's beef and it's also halal, it's also halal, so Muslim certified. Um, so you won't find Muslims working at the court plant, you know, in Columbus Junction. So it's a little more religiously diverse place. Um, but yeah, so if these women just basically would tell their line, their managers, hey, I'm going to, it's kind of, usually called a prayer would be one or two times during a typical shift. Um, but yeah, they, they, um, religion was at work in this plant. So very long answer to your question again, but hopefully that was okay. Oh, I'm Mike. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm kind of, I don't know where to look. Yeah, I didn't have that much coffee today either. <laughs> so, um, want me to hold it? So, um, I, I worked at an emergency room and in the two early 2000s, we were still seeing a lot of the meatpacking coming, uh, oh. injuries coming from uh, West Liberty. Um, and then they, they got shifted to a different uh, facility okay. but um, I was curious what, a lot of overuse injuries I just and I was wondering what the average uh, career span of That's a meat a packer question. is and then I wondered if you were if you're if they had increased the line times yet by the while you were doing this yeah this study I believe that's that's a um, thank you for that. I tried really hard to get access at West Liberty Food because I thought, okay, I've got hogs, cattle. I really wanted the turkeys represented, you know, the poultry, you know, but um, they just refused. I don't know why I couldn't charm my way in there, but um, I really wanted, yeah, West Liberty Foods is the turkey processing plant there. Yes, I'd say that. Um, yeah, the average work. I mean, I've talked with men who have been at Tyson Columbus Junction for 20, 25 years, which is unusual. I say the average is about 10, 15 tops, but oftentimes it's, you know, it's not in the same job. And so what I found is there's, there's, there's a, a closed loop. Folks move from plant to plant. And if they find that they can make more at Waterloo, they'll move there. If they can find that they can make more at Omaha or within the, the same plant, um, if they're working a really high intensity like saw, they might, they might only do that for a couple years and then they'll move on to the finer trimming, but then you start to get carpal tunnel. So there's a lot of movement within these plants. Um, Fernando, one of the men, uh, one of my interlocutors who's in here, he's worked at Tyson for close to 25 years, but he's had about five different jobs and he, his body is really hurt now and he's working in the intake barn. He's had a carpal tunnel surgery a couple of times. He's had back surgery. Um, this is an incredibly hard job on your body. So I'd say ten, it seems like with all the folks I interviewed, I'll have to look at broader statistics, you know, but it's about 10 years but I talked to some 20, 25 years, but those 10 years are never the same job. It's always moving within. And there was a gentleman I chatted with at Iowa Premium Beef who, oh, he had, he had a, just a terrible limp and he was just really shuffling along. And, you know, one of those yellow like buckets with the water and the, and the mops, you know, he was having a really hard time and I actually offered to help him. And it was like his fourth job in the plant and he had been really injured, he had fallen from a platform and was he wanted to still work and then they so they gave him his janitorial job which you know he 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 was very grateful that he stole the job he said he couldn't retire you know but um it, it's it's an industry that just breaks your body and if you really want a great piece on this eric schlosser's the chain never stops it was in mother jones oh 80s 90s it's a really classic piece it's really sad i cry every time i read it but that's like i would say the piece 
uh, that will, private statistics have been updated since then, but just how brutal this is on the body. But yeah, I have a lot of vignettes in here about, you know, wives massaging their husband's wrists at night, you know, using Tiger Balm uh, or BioFreeze. Tiger Balm seems to be the preferred balm of choice. It, it's like a warm, uh, it's in like a little, like a little glass pot that seems to be used by a lot of the African refugees I've talked with and Latinos. Um, I've heard BioFreeze being used, um, Asper cream, but there's a whole like pharmacology, over-the-counter OTC pharmacology, um, salt, hot baths, um, and most of the men, it was really, you know, a lot of the refugee men I interviewed, um, it was, it's a beautiful story. Um, it was Maurice about the bang guy interviewed him and his wife, Benita, who's a nurse. He didn't want her to work in the meatpacking industry because of the violence, but he said, you know, her hands are so beautiful. He said, the first thing I noticed about her when I met her were her beautiful hands and I don't want her hands ruined. So I really try to give a lot of stories in here, which I didn't read to you today. So I, yeah, I should read you a story, but thanks. That's a great question. Well, we do have a couple of questions. Did you want to read something now? Or we've got a couple coming um, on Zoom as well. I know we're not yeah. going to have time to get to near all the questions we, we have. have. Why don't we do a Zoom question? I'll find, um, I'll find some, one okay. of my friends so here. So I've got a couple I'm going to combine here. Um, one was asking if you have recommendations uh, to offer to other books uh, or resources oh, yeah. that address these issues in Iowa. And another question yes. more specifically says, have you compared your study and results with those of others who've studied the meatpacking industry uh, for example, Deborah Fink, and have yeah, you found any differences? Book. So yeah. kind of resources yeah. and, and maybe specific to some other research. Well, that's a very informed question. Thank you. Um, yes, um, there are, there's a lot of really wonderful secondary sources that I refer to. And Deborah Fink's book, Cutting Into the Meatpacking Line, is one. I think it came in, out in 98, also through UNC Press. A little shout out for my publisher. It was great. Um, yeah, Deborah Fink, uh, anthropologist, taught at Iowa State for a long time, and her first book was on Nebraska and working women. So she's looking a lot at class and working people. I would say the main difference between my work and Deborah Fink's work, and I, yeah, this, that's actually a great question for so many reasons. As an ethnographer of religion, trained as a social historian as, and as an anthropologist, I was duly trained. Um, most anthropologists who go into meatpacking plants um, don't give their real name. They sort of go undercover. And Deborah Fink was one of those. She actually worked in a pack in a packing plant um, in Western Iowa for about four months, I believe. Um, Porkopolis is a really great one that just came out from an anthropology colleague who teaches at Tufts. I'm blinking on his name right now, but Porkopolis, look it up. Alex Blanchett just came out like four months ago. Um, Steve Striffler's chicken is excellent. Um, Hamlet Fire, written by a journalist. It's on the chicken plant that burned and primarily that hit black working women uh, in a small town in North Carolina. So there have been a lot of really good books on meatpacking and, 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 and the racism and the precarity of the brown and black workers and white working people. What those books um, don't do that I do is I actually look at religion. Um, as a religious studies scholar, it's not something that I just went in like saying, it's there, you know, it actually really was there because everyone I talked to really talked about their faith being instrumental in literally getting through a work shift and, you know, helping them from their journey from their home country here, helping them in their daily lives. And so I like to think that my work complements a lot of the work that's already been done. And one of the things that I did methodologically that was different was I was very forthright with the packing plants. I identified myself as a scholar. I will say that professors in Iowa City are not well liked in rural Iowa. And they're like, oh, are you one of those like, you know, crunchy liberal professors, you know? And I will say, I didn't say that I was a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. I did say I didn't eat beef when I was at Iowa Cream Beef. I said I ate pork, but that I cooked it for my kids, which is true. Um, I, I, I think my, my whiteness, and so I, I'm, I'm self-reflexive about my identity and my positionality in the book. I think my whiteness, my Midwestern heritage, and I think my working class heritage, and the fact that I'll talk to anybody, my, my poor kids are always like, mom, we can't go anywhere without you knowing somebody or talking to somebody. I mean, I'm very talkative, as those of you know me, I'm very talkative. Um, I think that helped, you know, I, I'm not a snob, you know, and I'm from a working class family. And in, in, in a way, I'm like, I'm like a weirdo in my family. And so, and so when I went here, I'm like, 
these are my people, you know, I like know these people, I like get them, I know their stories. Um, I grew up hearing migration stories, you know, my great grandfather was a fruit peddler, you know, and they had a little corner store in Gary. So I think that um, it was important to me, my ethics of anthropology to be really forthright about who I was. And I had to be vetted. I had to meet with the board at Iowa Premium Beef and they welcomed me in. And I shared a couple chapters with them. I shared a couple chapters with um, Dave Duncan at Tyson. That's always been really important to me too, um, to share my work and not necessarily to change it uh, if I disagree with it. Um, but I wanted, I wanted them to see what was going to come out and so far they haven't had any negative comments, but yeah. But that was a great question about sources. And there's a lot more, just email me and I can give you more. So great. whoever sent that. Um, and unfortunately we just have a minute or two left. So we're going to have this be our final question. Okay. Uh, Christy will be uh, able to come out for those who are here in the room and uh, sign some books in the hallway. And uh, hopefully you can ask a couple of quick questions there as well. Here we go. Hi. Um I'm sorry, I'm gonna take this off because I'm soft-spoken. Um, thank you for your powerful book. Um, and here we are located in Southeast Iowa. Mm -hmm. And um, if we look at the possibility for social change and something um, to come forward from this, that could be good. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we're looking at what's opposite, which is going more with local foods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um as an ethnographer you mm -hmm. might um yeah. maybe you say you would have agency yeah. or a sense of power yourself mm -hmm. and you work for a university yeah think about the power that this institution here right in iowa city has for purchasing food yeah that's a great point point. and yourself as an employee of this institution yeah do you see any agency that you might have yeah. within your institution mm, for promoting uh, social change um, mm, for local question. foods, local meats, yeah. butchers, local farmers, yeah. dialoguing these institutions like the Catholicism with yeah. the student body? Most importantly, maybe the faculty members yeah. and um, getting on that approved vendor list for yeah, purchasing at the question. institution that is looking forward to the future. I hope that there's some optimism there. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that there would be any optimism? Yeah. Well, that is, um, that's a really great, rich question that you asked. I really appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, this is a hard book to write and I, I was really, it was hard to write about the, the chapters, I actually, I think I had a little PTSD from the research and I, I would wake up with nightmares about blood and cattle and, and it was really hard like trying to portray people's lives who were so precarious. It, it felt like such a huge responsibility. And then the what's next, right? So now what happens now that the book's gone? Um, yes, I, um, it's really important to me. Um, you know, there are those anthropologists out there who are activist anthropologists and I, I, I feel like my trajectory over the last 20 years as a scholar, I think I'm moving slowly in that direction. I've always thought of myself as a kind of moderate person who like, I always listen to both sides, you know? But I think that in this case, one of the areas where I've, I'm becoming more informed and I wanna start going to the meetings is at these parishes where the, the, the pre-unionization movement is starting to happen and percolate. That really excites me. I think that's the first step for these plants is to be able to unionize. I think that that's gonna be really important, but it's gonna to have to come from the workers. And so it's gonna take some time. And the folks leading that movement, I think are just spot on. So like David Gooner and his colleagues with Iowa CCI are really doing some great work. What you were saying about local foods, I think that's great. What I heard from a lot of my interlocutors is that they're hoping to save up enough money, uh, not only to get their kids through college and to buy, provide for their children, but that maybe they can buy a little bit of land and do something else. They don't wanna be at the packing plant. So there's a chapter in here where I interview some Latinos in Columbus Junction who have been able to start small businesses and to move out of the plant. And so um, some of the folks I talked with would very much like to, to farm because that's what they did in, in, their, in their home countries, right? 
And I was just listening to an NPR uh, special yesterday on chestnuts and how chestnuts might be the new thing and crickets, you know, in Iowa. So I've been thinking a lot about, you know, next projects, next steps, whether or not it's a book or not, maybe just an article or just, but really, um, I think my MO is to really amplify voices of my interlocutors and really try to find those spaces where uh, folks are able to move out of the industry and how can I use my privilege and resources to facilitate that? Like I'm in the process of setting up small scholarship at the Tyson plant um, and giving some of the proceeds to Catholic Worker House here locally from the book. So those are small steps that I'm trying to take because the Worker House here locally is pretty much a refugee house. Um, and I know my my friends here are very involved. Um, and so um, Kim and Tom Novak. And so I think that um, absolutely, I mean, the way I was trained was like, you know, you always have to have a separation, but I think that that's impossible once we know the story and once we see and hear all the crap that's happening. So this is going to be the next phase of my own career, really, and something that I wanna model for my students. Like this isn't just an academic thing, it's a very, it's an existential humanist thing. And so I really appreciate your questions and I don't have it all mapped out yet, but I'm definitely trying to move in that direction. So thank you, it was a great question. All right, well, we have reached the end of our time. Unfortunately, I know there were a lot more questions <laughs> yeah, to go. Uh, thank you so much, thank Christina you, John. Warren. Please help me. Uh, thank you, everybody. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to all of you who joined us here in the room. Thanks to those who watched via Zoom. A uh, recording of this uh, presentation will be up on the Book Festival website next week, so you can uh, send uh, your friends and colleagues that way. Uh, we still have more to come here in this room. Uh, Chewy Renteria will be uh, reading from his memoir, uh, We Heard It When We Were Young, at 2.30 in this space. And then I will be talking with Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, uh, about her book, Not a Nation of, Immig of Immigrants. She will be on screen joining us virtually, uh, but we will be here in the room uh, with that event, and that is at four o'clock here. Mm -hmm. Lots more to go. Uh, there are uh, festival programs over here on the side, or you can visit iowacitybookfestival.org for more information. Uh, Christy will be out at the Prayer Lights table uh, and happy, I'm sure, to sign your books <laughs> and chat more with you uh, so we can turn the room over and get ready for our next event. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, no, I was really glad. I'm like, oh, God, yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, it's good. I can't remember where it was. I can't remember where it was. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. Yeah.